The function of signalling on the railways is to keep the trains moving freely and safely. The type of signal most generally used is the semaphore, either lower or upper quadrant. Lower quadrant means that the signal arm is lowered when pulled off, whilst with upper quadrants the arm is raised. The practice of signalling has grown increasingly complex as the railways expanded to cope with the ever-increasing traffic. Great junctions may look complicated, but the basic principles of signalling are the same throughout. The demands of the working timetable are met by means of the block signalling system, which operates the line in sections, maintaining a safe distance clear in front of and behind each train. The length of a block section varies according to the density of the traffic, though other factors, such as gradients, junctions, stations and so forth, enter in. In its simplest form, it generally extends from one station to the next, and the entrance to each block section is guarded by signals controlled from the previous signal box. Before going into details of working, we'll take a run through a block section on the down line of a stretch of double road. The distance signal of the box ahead is against us, in the horizontal position, which means caution. It's not a stop signal, but we must expect to find the next signal also against us and be prepared to stop. The distant has a yellow face with a black V and fishtail end to the arm. At night, it shows a yellow light for caution and green for clear. Here in front of our signal box is the home signal, the first stop signal, on against us. Distance are interlocked with their corresponding stop signals so that the cautionary distant cannot be pulled off if one or more of the stop signals is still at danger. Home and all other stop signals are painted red with a white vertical stripe. At night the lights are red for stop and green for clear. Here is the station. In advance of the platform is the starting signal, or starter. This signal will have to be pulled off before the train can enter the section ahead. The reverse sides of all signals are white with a black stripe, which prevents confusion with signals for the other direction. At night, a small white light shows when the arm is at danger. Before we leave the section, let's make sure we understand exactly what a block section is. Here, the block section of a down line consists of the stretch from A's starter to B's home. The object of absolute block working is to ensure adequate space intervals between trains on the same line. And therefore, the basic principles consist of the prevention of more than one train being in the same block section at any one time. Now let's see how the particular signals are controlled from the box we just passed. This is a simple manual signal box. From this box, the signalman, let's call him Bert, controls all the points and signals in his area, together with the entrance to the block sections ahead on either road. The various levers are differently coloured for easy distinction. Yellow for distance, red for stop signals, black for points, white for spare levers, and so on. They're also numbered to relate them to the diagram above. Just as distant signals are interlocked with their homes and starters so that they cannot be pulled off on their own, so various other signals and points are interlocked one with another so that conflicting roads cannot be thrown open at the same time. Where signals cannot be seen from the box due to curves or bridges, electrical repeaters are fitted above the levers to show the signalman whether they've responded correctly. Similarly, where a portion of the line is hidden from the box, it may be connected electrically to track indicators. This device is known as a track circuit. Pairs of wheels short circuit one rail to the other and their presence shows on the indicator. Thus, the signalman can see the exact moment at which the hidden part of the line becomes clear or occupied. 
It can also be used to lock points and signals in accordance with the occupation of the track. These instruments are the block telegraphs, by means of which Bert maintains contact during train movements with Charlie on the one hand and Arthur on the other, in the down and up sections on either side of his box. Our train is now ready to pull out of the station. Before Bert allows it to leave, he must ask Charlie to accept it into his section. Bert calls attention with one ring to Charlie on the block bell, and Charlie rings back once in reply. Bert now rings, is line clear? He offers the train, as we say, by ringing three and one, which is the code for stopping passenger trains. Charlie's line must be clear for at least a quarter of a mile beyond his home signal, the required minimum before he accepts Bert's train by repeating the three and one signal. Then he pegs the block telegraph instrument, connecting with Bert, to the line clear position. As soon as Bert's telegraph receives the line clear signal, he pulls off his starting signal, which opens the line to Charlie's section. He rings twice to Charlie, meaning train entering section. Charlie pegs his telegraph to Bert to train on line. Bert, meanwhile, enters his train times in the register. The train now enters Charlie's section. As soon as the last vehicle of the train is a quarter of a mile beyond his home signal, Bert calls Arthur, and when acknowledged, rings two and one, meaning train out of section. Then he releases his telegraph connection to Arthur, which returns from the train on line position to line blocked. Another train is due, an express. Arthur is now calling Bert's attention. Bert acknowledges, and Arthur rings four, thus asking Bert to accept an express passenger train. Bert checks that his section is clear for a quarter of a mile beyond the home signal, and checks that his points are set for through traffic, and then rings back four, accepting the train. Now he pegs his telegraph to Arthur to line clear. Let's follow the express train on a diagram. The train is approaching A's box. The telegraph tells him the road is clear. He pulls off his signals, opening the line to B. A rings train entering section to B, who pegs train on line. As the train passes A's signals, he puts them back. B calls C's attention. C replies. B asks C to accept an express train. Four rings. C accepts four rings and pegs to line clear. B pulls off his signals. Now it's B's turn to ring train entering section and C's to reply by acknowledging and pegging train on line. When the train is a quarter of a mile beyond his home signal, B rings train out of section to A. Two, pause, one. A acknowledges. B restores his telegraph to line blocked and puts back his signals. C obtains permission from the next signal box in advance, pulls off his signals, and the express proceeds on its way. As the train goes by each box, the signalman checks that the tail lamp is in position to make sure that the complete train has passed before he sends train out of section. Finally, he completes his train register. So there you have the general idea of absolute block working. The title helps to distinguish it from permissive working, where generally at large passenger stations or on goods lines, a signalman is permitted under proper safeguards to admit trains to an occupied section. Absolute block is always controlled by a signalman, either manually or by power in some very big boxes. The term is used to distinguish the system from automatic systems, although the latter are certainly absolute in themselves. But although for clarity we've considered absolute block in its simplest form, signalling in its fullest sense governs the working of any kind of track layout. For instance, at this station, the signalman can switch points number 24 and run the shunting engine into the yard. 
though of course the interlocking in his box would prevent him doing so unless his through line signals were at caution and danger. Where facing points are concerned, as at number 14, a facing points locking lever would be included. Interlocking would prevent the home being pulled off unless the points were properly locked. This detector prevents the appropriate signal being operated unless the points are pulled right over to the stock rail and locked in position, less than one eighth of an inch clearance being allowed. All these devices are applicable to all systems of signaling, and so are many other types of signal, such as a disk signal, which is used to permit shunting back over trailing points or for through running line. It's simply a small stop signal at ground level called a Tommy Dodd or Dolly. Then there's the repeater signal, usually of the banner type, set where the main signal may be obscured from some positions by, say, a bridge. Coloured lights in which the semaphore arm is dispensed with show a bright hooded light and thus give the indication by day in the same manner as at night. Nor must the importance, especially in shunting or unusual operating, of hand signals be forgotten. Though perhaps the most important type of special signal for use at unusual times is the detonator, the fog signal, which we'll use now to bring us to the end.